honored to be part of this convening with um, what's really impressive me about it, among many other things, is the generational uh, components. For those of us who've been around a long time, and some have been around uh, some of the time and some newcomers. And I think that's very heartening for us, us old timers um, to see that this, the legacy and this tradition of this interest in this work is going to be carried forward for a long time. Um, because many times we think that it's going to get lost, the work that was done in earlier periods. So I want to thank you all for being here, for carrying on this tradition, for your, for your interest. Um, it was, I want to thank Selma James for her comments reminding us of um, the kind of thinking that grounded uh, the, the, the issues we are talking about today, especially around race and poverty and low-income women and welfare rights. Um, this has, as uh, both uh, Selma James and Premal have said, is kind of, some of that has been forgotten in the modern women's movement, and so it's really heartening to these reminders. And also to Premala for really making visible some of the current uh, low income women's activism that also gets lost in the shuffle of our discussion. So I just, all of that makes me feel very honored and very happy uh, to be here. Um, I'm going to be, um, those of you who know my work, um, I do historical work, I do theoretical historical, but in the past period I've um, started to do some survey research which is a real shift. I don't know quite how I got there, but that's what I'm going to be reporting on, on today. Um, and it comes from my interest in the human service workforce. I teach in the School of Social Work. I make new social workers. And they are, they are um, living and having to work in this environment, this neoliberal environment, <coughs> where um, uh, so much is being transformed. And as I'm talking, you might also want to think, most of you, I assume, are in universities, not human service agencies. And as I start talking about the impact of privatization on the workforce, I think you will be able to make connections to what's going on in the universities. Because what I'm going to be talking about is um, cuts across many industries, if you will, many sectors. And it's happening around the world. So with that, um, Rose will slow getting this stuff here. So, um, no, that's what I want to do. Okay. So, what, what, just, just one of them is showing on the screen? Because <laughs> you see two of them. This one is showing, okay. So, um, so at one time we thought of the feminist movement as an intellectual revolution. And there was an intellectual revolution sparked by feminism that revealed that the study of gender, like race and class, uncovered previously ignored information and introduced new analyses of the social, economic, and political relations, including the welfare state, which has been my area of work for all these years. So by applying a gender lens, feminists discovered that women reformers played a central role in the construction of the welfare state, which was really not known back then. Um, they also discovered that the welfare workforce was predominantly women and persons of color and watching women of color, and that its, that its programs underwrote, that is socialized, or made public the course of social reproduction. Um, this is often referred to as women's unpaid care work in the home, and also their low paid care work on the job, which is more the focus of mine. So, um, uh, sorry, just have to get my notes of this coordinated. So I'm going to try to continue in this tradition by suggesting that the war on the welfare state, especially budget cuts and privatization, translate into a war on social reproduction, carried out by women, mostly in the home, but as again said, on the job. So I'm going to do quickly uh, define social reproduction, which probably isn't necessary for this group, but it is work that's assigned both to women and also to the welfare state. Discuss trends in privatization of the welfare state, I present some preliminary findings from this newfound interest of mine in survey research. Uh, it's called the Human Service Workforce Survey, which examines the privatization in the public and nonprofit sectors that has affected the capacity of frontline New York City human service workers to carry out the work of social reproduction. So here's a quote from Terry O'Neill that kind of says a little bit of it. I'll let you read it for a minute. 
Anyway, what, what I liked about it is I talked about women who were working and also women who were served by social welfare programs. So you brought it all together. So social reproduction uh, refers to activities established by societies to further procreation, socialization, sexuality, nurturance, and family maintenance. They take place in, the, in, um, in family, schools, religious organizations, but also the welfare state. Um, it is carried out by women's unpaid domestic labor in the home and their low-paid market labor. And in both spheres, women provide care, and I'll take your comments into consideration here. Um, they do work um, to, to provide care, to take care of fully functioning individuals, as well as those too old, too young, too sick, disabled, to really take care of themselves in that sense of the word. Um, the, the capacity of the welfare state and its ability to support, support the work of social reproduction was dramatically altered by um, two major economic crises of the 20th century. The collapse of the economy in the 1930s and fall of profits in the mid-70s. So in response to the first crisis, which you all know, the nation's leaders, leaders called on the government to step in. And from 1930 to the 1970s, the growing number of New Deal and Great Society programs redistribute income downward, re uh, uh, deprivatize social provision or social reproduction, and expand the role of the state. The expanding state underwrote the work, the work of social reproduction on two fronts. Both the public and nonprofit the providers hired more workers to fill the new jobs, as you were describing, this expansion of this, this work outside the home. Um, and uh, these services basically absorbed, took on the work of social reproduction. Um, and the, the services, the services provided by the welfare state workers um, ease the burden of care work uh, carried out in the home or the work of social reproduction. So it was, it was a double-edged thing. Then everything changed in the mid-70s when the nation experienced what I call the, the U-turn in public policy. But in response to the second major economic crisis of the 20th century, the National League decided to solve their economic problems by undoing the New Deal and undoing the Great Society. And, and the, the, the goals were to, and what they did was to they redistribute income upwards, down, uh, downsize the state, and reprivatize social reproduction, which led to this crisis in social reproduction that we're having today. What so the main tactics included the all too familiar tax cuts, budget cuts, privatization, devolution, weakening the influence of social movements, and at the same time, it's now in the early 80s, that the, the, the far right starts to call for a singular version of family values and a colorblind social order. Of the universities, a parallel phenomenon to what I'm 
talking about. And the third step, which I'm not going to talk about today, is financialization. Reframing human services as an investment opportunity. And with this, things like social income, impact bonds, pay for success, are and then which the, uh, the Obama administration supports as well. Um, seem to parallel the financialization of the economy in general, which is why we gave it that name. So our study focused on managerialism, also known as New Public Management, NPM. And in this period, public and private funders have increasingly required nonprofit and public sector as well, agencies to demonstrate efficiency, productivity, accountability, and the ability to count, uh, compete for clients, funds, and market share. Now, if you're in the human services, you hear people talking about these things in these words all the time. If you're not, start listening. Um, so in other words, they force the agencies to run like a business with, with a strong focus on this, which leads to the work gets organized, standardized, and quantified due to the, uh, having to um, produce and measure everything in order to achieve performance outcomes. Rarely are mentioned are the ideals of equality, common good, and social justice. So in the review of the literature, this is some of the things we found. That um, managerialism, um, at the same time that poverty and unemployment were increasing the demand for human services, right? It asks agencies and workers to do more with less. Less revenue, lower salaries, fewer, uh, more, more, uh, more office closures, de-skilled workforce, and so on. And it is transforming the administration of public and nonprofit agencies from a service to an entrepreneurial culture. So now the heads of organizations are no longer human service professionals, they are MBAs or lawyers. And I understand we were talking, that's not university, it's happening in universities, less likely than educators and um, some of the business world. Clients are often called customers or consumers, and services are referred as products. So picking up the business language, it's not accidental. And managerialism places high trust in these business methods and low trust in public servants. And so these, these new incentives um, uh, adopted it just creates incentives to adopt this business model to focus on. So agencies start to focus on the bottom line. Well, let's get the, the people who can, we can treat fast and get out, or people who can pay more, um, short-term girls, see more people. This is sort of a, um, we can talk more about this in a few minutes. Um, so the, this ad, the, so the advent of privatization and its operationalization on the ground floor as managerialism have raised many questions. Now scholars have, have, have studied the impact of this on uh, uh, service users, somewhat on programs, but many fewer have looked at how these trends affect the workforce itself and, um, and the, uh, how it affects working conditions, the provision of service, and the well-being of both clients and workers. And when I'm talking to a human service audience, I say, we rarely study ourselves, which I think is, is true. So to correct for this, we studied, uh, we, we launched this survey, uh, the Human Service Workforce Study, and the tag was, your voice is needed. We wanted to draw in human service workers. Now, in our conversations before the study, we found that some human service workers are kind of like this, like these new trends, they think that it gives them evidence, they can um, they, they know better what works, and some of this is actually uh, true, um, but there are lots of problems with it. Um, and, but others are troubled by the impact on this work, saying that um, they have to rely on poorly designed performance measures. It costs many workers their hard-won public and uh, non-profit sector jobs, and those left behind in both places have to do more with less organizational uh, capacity and resources. So, I mean, we clearly were worried about the impact of managerialism on human service agencies and workers and on social reproduction. Um, but as researchers, as good researchers, we said, we need to stand back, gather, and get, you know, sort of hold our biases in check, and let's see what the people we are talking to think. So we tried to construct a study where we made a whole list of things, which I'll show you in a minute, and asked people if they thought there were major 
problem, a minor problem, not a problem at all, or not applicable here. So it gave people a chance to say what they really thought. So, so um, we got, we had the help of um, uh, several uh, partners in the human service community in New York City. I'll just list them there. They are major social welfare um, federations <coughs> and so on. And they basically, um, we reviewed the survey with them. They, um, and they helped us distribute. This is an electronic survey. And they helped us distribute. Without them, we could not have done this. And um, I'll tell you in a minute, we have 3,000 respondents, which is a huge number. And when people got this, they sent it to their friends, they sent it all over the country. We couldn't use them all because some were in Kansas and California. It went like, I'd like to say, viral in a very <laughs> small way. <laughs> um, so this was an anonymous electronic survey. Over 3,000 people responded it during the time period. Um, and we, we sort of we tried to contain it to the New York metropolitan area. At 2,700, we could use about 2,700. Um, so I'm going to discuss some of these findings with you. First, of who participated? In it. So, so the, the next slide shows you some of the demographics, and I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time going over them, but they kind of represent the gender balance, or they represent um, the balance in the field. We probably have um, a slightly more uh, of people of color responding to the survey than we typically get in these kinds of surveys, and that probably has to do with the fact that one of our partners was Local 371, the public sectors unions. There were a lot of um, there were a lot of workers of color throughout both sectors, but they concentrated there mostly uh, social MSW social workers because that's who was distributing it. But we got program managers, we got a few CEOs, and so on. And um, you know, some distribution of our years, years in the field, you can see we thought that was important because the people who were there longer were more aware of the changes. And uh, and same with stuff for older workers. But we have a nice distribution, you can see, by age. Um, one thing I'd like to say that this was a quantitative study, but we left room for people to comment. We got so many comments. We, we ended up feeling like we, we hit a nerve. We, we have a mini qualitative study built into this, unsolicited because people are so upset about what's going on. So who participated in this study? So here are um, the, the characteristics of who um, participated in the study, give you a little clue what their positions was, but whether the public and the nonprofit sector, was there a union representative, we have almost 40% union uh, representation, no, almost a third, I should say, union representation, which again represents the public sector because the nonprofit sector is barely unionized at all. Um, and then you can see the program focus. We, we, we've got a wide range of different settings because we wanted to see how, if there were differences, with, like with some settings being hit hard by this managerialism more than others. Um, social work is mostly health and mental health, so you see a lot, but that's where the majority came from. But you see, we were able to get quite a few in other settings as well. Um, so, the, what is, so then we try to look at the what's the context in which this is, what's going on in the agencies? So we, I guess, work is a little bit about that. Um, and um, so um, in terms of the clients or service users, reflecting the, uh, this austerity era, close to 90% of the clients are presenting with more complex needs. This is what people said were problematic, that, um, and that the clients were more stressed. Um, and the quality of working conditions um, was deteriorating or highly problematic. Um, the, um, the, the do, so um, the doing more with less, the slide shows what was happening in terms of doing more with less. More than uh, half the programs said they were having cutbacks, staff cutbacks, program closures. This, we, this was in the literature I mentioned before. Now they're actually telling us that this has happened. Um, and uh, many of the respondents said they were they had adopted these well-known uh, uh, practices of new public management, including electronic records, performance measures, and evidence-based models. These are increasingly part of what's going on. And that uh, the working conditions were uh, increased work. Look at these high numbers: 80 percent, 70 percent. More documentation, which is key to this, because doing all that you can't do. Other than the work you're supposed to do. I don't know how many of you got a got a doctor today who sits in front of the computer and doesn't call people to look at you, so that 
where documentation interferes with the normal interactions that humans feel they're supposed to have. And, and also their work is, their own work is being evaluated using um, the monitoring process, it's not time monitoring. So here's a quote from a social worker sort of commenting on that. Executive director of a community based agency, I'll let you read it. So what to be fine? I'm not expecting you to uh, read this on chart, I'm going to break it out. These are um, so this is a high percentage of um, respondents with different sectors, positions, and programs reported key aspects of managerialism as problematic in their workplace. Um, and these findings indicate the ways in which neoliberal privatization, i.e. managerialism, as it shows up on the front lines, un undermines the uh, state support for the work of social re reproduction. So the, these are the, we, we, um, we use the, we, we, on this list of those were more than 50% of the workers um, said it was problematic and um, it had 30 of the 45 that were included in the Some comments. So these are some of the qualitative comments that came through, as I mentioned before. 
And then a, a, a worker, um, one of my favorites, a worker, interviewed by a Canadian researcher who discovered in our literature review, claimed that managerialism had stricter care out of social work on the job. And then um, we, were, we, we, we were looking at the different, this chart shows the different settings, and it shows how people scored on, we developed a new public management score based on those uh, 31 items. And it was very interesting to see that the people who scored um, lowest, who were less concerned about it, happened to work in the settings that you might call where the clients were viewed as more deserving in public mind. And then you see that the highest scores were in public assistance and child welfare. So we don't know quite what to make of this, but it was kind of interesting that the, the, the people who found that these conditions of managerialism most problematic were in probably largely in the public sector, although for the child welfare goes in both public and nonprofits. So demographics matter. Um, since much of this work is about social reproduction, typically assigned to women, um, we wanted to see how, what kind of difference that gender made. Um, more with women, um, people who were more concerned, women more than men, workers of color more than white workers, public sector more than nonprofit sector workers, and unionized versus non-unionized workers. Now we think there's some overlap here because of the unionized workers, the public sector, and people of color tend to be in the same, they're, they're, in the, they're, all, they're captured in the same part of the workforce. We also asked the question about work and family balance. And here, more um, women than men reported lack of family friendly uh, work policies on the job is highly problematic. And um, women were 37% more likely than men to, re to report this. Um, and that more women than men found the inability to complete work during normal work hours is highly problematic. I even took the work home in order to make sure that the needs of the people that were uh, responsible for the people were getting there. Is someone are talking about that. So then we wanted to know how did these uh, human service workers manage the pressures <coughs> that, are, that they're facing? Um, and we found the literature said that they found that work is bent to rules um, uh, by taking statistics making time motion studies to lower benchmarks, conducted work slowdowns to comply with paperwork demands, and consciously lowered performance outcomes to prevent heightened expectations. So we wanted to find out what was going on in our workforce. And so these are some of the things that we found. In light of what I just said before, 70% said they worked overtime without paying to make sure client needs were met, which was um, uh, one coping strategy, if you will, that took the, took the work out of their own time. Um, but then you see some of the others that loosely interpret program requirements, ch uh, change reports to meet with performance requirements, inflated statistics, ignored eligibility requirements. These are all things that these workers had some discretion and some autonomy in their job that allowed them to do this. We think the numbers are much higher than this because people are not so likely to want to confess to doing these kind of things. And then we looked at the um, impact of this on the, the well-being of, of the workforce. So, um, so we, we use a, a well-known stress measure, the perceived stress scale. We use a short version of it, and you can see I felt used up at the end of the day. My job was too stressful. Difficulties are piling up. I'm able to control important things in my life. And in general, women and men felt their job was too stressful, so, and so on. Um, there were also some health problems that show up. And we asked about job-related health problems. Very specific about that. So you can see fatigue, neck back pain, stomach, blood pressure, all these things um, from 25% to 69% are problematic. And then you see that mental health and behavioral problems people reported. These are self reported, you know, anxiety, sleeping problems, etc. At the same time, just to be honest But basically, many health problems, many mental health problems are showing up on the job. Um, and then the social justice mission is we asked about this advocacy and community mobilization and so on, and because these agencies are supposed to do this work. And uh, you can see that there were some high numbers of people thought that the social justice mission of their agencies 
uh, was, it was compromised. And then um, these issues, um, the things that are often talked about in terms of any workplace burnout, burnout, out, turnover, and so on. And in the human service work, there's, there's very, a lot of concerns about high turnover, people come and go, they leave their jobs, especially in some areas, and we think these are um, these are retention issues, and we hope to be able to bring these up to the work workforce retention issues that we hope to be able to bring up when we talk, when we present this report to the human service of communities. Um, and also there's reduced uh, job satisfaction. So it's from the perspective of more than 2,500 human service workers, privatization in the form of managerialism poses a serious threat to the capacity of human service workers who assign the task of carrying out the work of social of reproduction, on which their jobs depend and which the people they help and uh, depend. Um, so, um, okay, so here is someone's comment about that. We like to bring voices from the field into our discussion. And I'm just going to one more. So, the combination of welfare state cuts and managerialism means fewer services and less support for the work of social reproduction carried out in the home and on the job, um, both of which are, are, are assigned to women, as you all know. There are fewer set public sector jobs, but women also predominate as public sector workers. And these jobs once provided upward mobility for women, both uh, white women and women of color, and the private sector just wouldn't would hire us, so these jobs are disappearing, so there are huge implications along those lines. And also, the war in the welfare state is weak in public sector unions. You know that the private sector unions, only 7% of the private sector workforce is now not, uh, unionized. So they got, they got their way with the private sector, now they're going after the public sector, which held its own until now. And really, these unions are one of the few institutions with the capacity to represent middle and working classes and check the corporate power inside and outside the government and, and thus support the work of social reproduction. At the end of the day, women who continue to do the work of social reproduction for the state have to pick up the slack. Those who are left, if the old list comes on, and they have less, there's less organization capacity, less staff, and less resources. And so, that I, uh, I'm writing something else about this crisis in the social reproduction, and these are some of the components of it, how this shows up on, 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 in terms of the welfare state, the crisis of the welfare state, that is the neoliberal crisis of the welfare state. 